Welcome to Agile Roots 2010. Sponsored by Version 1, Rally Software, Virio, Amerisys, Agile Alliance, and Exmission Internet. Growing Up Agile by Pat Maddox. Well, first of all, thank you guys very much for coming. Uh, this is kind of cool, you know, like I, I hate the rock star moniker that gets thrown around in programming, but it's kind of like being the Beatles playing for, for a standing room only crowd here. You guys, you guys know that. Um, you guys are lucky that you get to see Terry. Yeah. yeah, I figure you'll come away from this talk saying, Pat Maddox's talk was the best. And I say, well, what do you say? And I don't know, but people are really comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll take it as a challenge to make sure that I keep you guys engaged and awake for the next 20 minutes. So, all right, so I'm going to talk about growing up agile. And the point, the, the, the way I snuck my way into this talk, I think, is that I think I have a unique perspective on agile software development, or at least unique from many of the people at this conference. Um, but one of the ideas that I've kind of had over the last year is that software makers change the world. And this isn't something that I thought when I originally got into software. You know, I got into software because programming is fun. And I still do it because programming is fun. But I, but I think this is very true. And I tell people this idea, and they say, you know, they just laugh at me. And they're oh, you're young, so idealistic and stuff. But I've got a couple good examples. This is, uh, there's a project called Baobab. And this isn't actually Baobab. This is Jackie Maher. She's a programmer that works on Baobab. And Baobab is this organization that is fighting the AIDS epidemic in Malawi, in Africa. And they basically got like these $50 little laptop type things. And they're creating open source systems to install in the different villages and hospitals in Malawi. And their goal is to educate the communities there. They want to get people in, get them tested for AIDS. They you know, give people condoms and they tell them about safe sex and how to not continue this AIDS epidemic. And they're doing it using open source software and writing open source software. And if you go to GitHub, you can search for Baobab and you'll find the open source systems that they're using. So that's a really cool project. I think it's very worthwhile. Another quick example, this is the Sunlight Foundation. Their goal is to make government transparent and accountable using technology. And they're doing a whole bunch of different things. They've got, they record all the different votes in Congress and they're working on an open source voting system because they think that, I think voting systems are controlled by like three different companies right now. And you know, there's always a lot of debate as to how valid they are sometimes and, and just a lot of problems with them. They also collect information for basically every single government agency that there is and they compile it and they publish it out to people. So one of the interesting things I saw when I went to go check this out the other day was they have uh, the British Petroleum. There are 8,000 reports to the National Reporting Service of spills and leaks uh, from British Petroleum facilities, including over 550 from the same area where that platform recently exploded. Which makes me kind of wonder what the National Reporting Service is reporting and who they're reporting it to, but that's a separate thing. So you've got this foundation, which is trying to make that stuff available to people throughout the United States. And this, can you guys see that back there? Oh, it's kind of dark. Well, this is one of my friends, Ramon Garcia. He is, I was talking with him at Rails Conference. He just launched a new project in the last few months called El Pastito de Internet. And he lives in Spain. His idea is that he is going to revolutionize democracy first in Spain and then in South America and hopefully throughout the world. The idea being that every person gets a single vote. And that says, uh, una persona, un voto, por qué no? One person, one vote, why not? And although it's kind of a scary thing, if you go on YouTube, you see, you see all the comments that say they maybe don't want to give people on the internet vote. <laughs> 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 but still, the, his, you know, in, in Spain, like, according to him, I don't know anything about Spanish government, but a uh, very corrupt system. He also sees a lot of things going on in the world that he is not particularly fond of. We have a lot of war, we've got environmental disasters, usually, you know, man-made environmental disasters. Uh, so, and, and corruption everywhere. And so he's trying to put somebody in, he wants to put a representative in government that's accountable to the people. And so I would have a vote on every issue. But because I don't care about every issue, I could delegate my vote to <coughs> a particular person or you know, a politician or uh, some party like Greenpeace or whatever. So I vote on the things that I care about and then they get delegated. 
And eventually you've got the people in Congress who are actually voting according to what the people want. So, three projects, all changing the world in some way. And I think that you know everybody that's been in software for, you know, people have been in here for decades now, uh, and I'm sure you guys could come up with some of the examples of your own. So, of course, not all software is like this, right? There's a continuum of goodness. I think, and on one end, you've got the virus writers. They don't contribute anything positive to the world. It's just all <laughs> negative. And then you've got your AIDS fighters, the democratic revolutionaries, all that, all the people wherever they're there, there that maybe I admire, but I'm probably not going to fly to Africa and spend six months there with no wireless. <laughs> this is they get wireless in there. Uh, you know, and then somewhere in the middle, you've got the apathetic code monkeys, the people that are just kind of going in and, and writing their code, and you know, they don't really give a shit about what's going on or what they're doing. They just kind of take their take their uh, uh, commands from their boss. Somewhere in between, hopefully between the apathetic code monkeys and our uh, you know Mother Teresa's of the software world, if you will, there's us. And we're working on all different kinds of projects and coming to conferences like these and sharing ideas and spreading ideas. And the ultimate goal of all of this, everything that we're doing and everything that these people are doing, is to create value. This is trumpeted in the Agile community, you know, ever since Agile originated. And I think there are two major ways that I, I think of creating value. One interpretation is a very simple business sense. I create something that other people pay for. And so we always talk about, we need to create value, create value. Uh, what is something that I can build that my boss can sell to somebody else and so I've created value in the world. But there's also a personal interpretation of it uh, that you create change within somebody, you have an effect on them in some way. So if you've read any of Seth Godin's stuff, he talks about everybody being artists and me sharing something with somebody and creating change in them. So we want to create value in some way which now, on a business level is what will somebody pay for? And in, on a personal level, how can I change them? So speaking of change, Agile software changed the software world. I mean, the, there's some folks in here that, that were at the very forefront of Agile software development and Agile thinking. And they're working in very dysfunctional organizations. They're working in organizations that maybe never ship code. And if they ever do ship a project, it's buggy, it costs way more than it should have, or nobody cares about it. And they're working in organizations that have a strong cover your ass culture, uh, a, lot of, a lot of infighting, people are segregated, nobody's actually working with each other to create value. And so what Agile did is they proposed an ethical value system. As uh, Diana talked about yesterday, Agile software development, we're trying to make people more productive and we're trying to inject more humanity and sustainability into software development. And so with this ethical value system, it's a system that, that lets people have courage in the face of uncertainty. This idea that we're building software and we're not quite sure what it means to do, and we'll find out. And that takes some courage, saying I'm not quite sure what's going to happen. And it takes courage to look back at the last three months of work and say, you know what, that wasn't quite, quite right. We're going to have to toss it all out, toss it all out, and start over again. Or we're going to need to rip out this chunk and do something new. It takes courage to talk to people, like genuinely talk to people on a deep level, and find out what they want and how you can how you can help them. And it takes courage to want to change. You know, Luke gave that talk this morning, and he stood there in front of the what four, six hundred people, whatever it is, and he said, "I want to change the world." And I think that that takes courage as well. And the, now Agile is, is giving us a platform where we can have that courage to change the world. The other thing that Agile kind of really brought about is the idea of humanity, that software is for people. That we're, at the end of the day, this stuff is going out to people, it's you know real people, not, not us. Like We're people, but we're the techies. We're the ones that really uh, think like a computer, more or less. And we're, we're trying to build software for regular people to use to enhance their lives. And every time we build crappy software, we create more frustration for them. As, uh, as Alistair would say, we're you know, bringing negative chaos to the world or something like that, when we really want more harmony. So it's for people, and it's by people. Right? We 
are we are the makers of software. We are the ones making all this happen. And it's important to take us into account as well <coughs> with this whole thing. And ultimately, in all of this, we're trying to create some form of change. We're trying to create it in the people for, who, for whom we build the software. And then we're also creating it for ourselves. We spend a lot of time doing this stuff. We put a lot of our emotional energy into this. And hopefully, we get some kind of a change. Although, of course, this is not an overnight switch. Agile has been doing working on this for about 10 years. And if you look at the major things that Agile is focused on, it has been focusing on certain bottlenecks. What's going wrong with the software process? How do we fix it? And the two major bottlenecks that Agile was meant to tackle is quality and feedback. You're building these projects that came out buggy, and you're building stuff that people don't really care about. The customer asks for something, developers work on it, you know, they say, this is what I want. Three months later, the developers come back and say, here it is. And the customer says, what the hell are you doing? So how do you create a system that lets you build quality into the software from the get-go? And how do you get feedback on the stuff that you're building? So the Agile paradigm is requirements come from the person funding the project. And we actually have a name for that. We call it the customer. And the idea that you will talk to the customer and actually get input from them is, is revolutionary. Most of the time, before this, it's just go build this. But now, you know, we, have, uh, we, we actually have this idea of an on-site customer. Somebody's paying me to build software, and I'm saying, no, you can't just go off and do your own thing. Sit your ass right there, so that when I'm not sure what to do, I can just look over my shoulder and say, is this what you need? And so Agile, for the last 10 years, working on this stuff, has really been perfecting process. And it's how do we create this sort of process that lets us have an active communication loop with our customers and then get feedback on the stuff we're doing and build it at a high level of quality. So I'm going to change gears for just a minute and tell you a little bit about my story because I'm up here. So uh, I talked about myself for two minutes. And I think it also you know, helps present the perspective that I've got here. I, I got really interested in programming in second grade. I had this really great teacher, Mrs. Fletcher. Uh, she was my computer teacher three days a week. And she saw that I got incredibly bored in class. Like I was just not engaged in the classes. But not doing her activities, it was I would go off and do other stuff. And she recognized this. And so she, at, over time, she just came up with new activities for me. And she told me to go sit in the corner and work on stuff. And not just kind of do whatever, but she came up with new things for me. And when I finished those, she actually gave me the logo programming manual because we're working on app enthusiasm and she's like, here, just go, you know, whatever. So uh, I should probably, I should thank her. Miss, yeah, I might show her. Mrs. Fletcher, when you watch this, I want to say thank you because uh, you could have just written me off as hyperactive and sent me to the principal. <laughs> but, you know, because of that, like I get to be involved in, in, a, in a fantastic community and an amazing conference like this. Did you test drive your logo? I did not test drive my logo. I did not learn <laughs> test driven development until, well, I'll tell you. So of course, you can't really program when you're in second grade. It's kind of pathetic. <laughs> uh, my, you know, my teacher told my mom about, hey, Pat really likes computers. You, you should uh, pay attention to this. And so my mom made me a, a book deal. She basically said, I'll get you a computer book, and whenever you finish it, I'll get you a new one. <coughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> right, you are. Her thinking was these are 400 page, highly technical, dense, dry manuals. I'm going to read, you know, I'm going to spend a week on this and that's it, done. I'm going to go back to climbing on trees and kicking girls over. Oh, well, that's, that's, <laughs> that's like second grade, so I, I don't know what I did in second grade. Studying. Studying is what I did. Uh, yeah. But, no, she, um, yeah, so she bought me a bunch of books. And after five or six at 40, 50 bucks a pop, she was like, okay, I'm just going to take you to the bookstore and you get to hang out. <laughs> 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 so I wandered into the bookstore, and one day I saw this thin little white book called Extreme Programming Explained. And this, you know, like, as, you know, scanning the book, looking for something new, and my eyes came across this, and I immediately snatched it out. And I basically, I sat in the bookstore, and I read and read and read, and I read up until the time when the bookstore closed. I was there from right when I got out to school to a few minutes before the store closed. 
And when my mom came to pick me up, I begged her to buy this for me. I was like, Mom, I have to have this. But see, because you have to understand, uh, there were maybe 20 pages in this book that I understood. I didn't get any of it. <laughs> Not a clue. But I knew, I just knew in my soul that if I studied this over and over again, I would learn how to code while base jumping off the Empire State Building. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I see you do that, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Coding? Coding while arguing with the team. Yeah, that's, you know what, what's more difficult than, than coding, coding while arguing. base jumping and coding while arguing with Alex. <laughs> uh, so then I finally go off to college. I'm really excited. You know, finally, I'm going to start studying this stuff and learning from the best in the world. I will join the ranks of the elite programmers, probably somewhere like Microsoft. And, you know, I'm done with all that open source stuff where uh, people are just kind of hacking in their bedrooms in their spare time. Probably dorky teenagers. <laughs> and uh, I went, and I lasted three months. It turned out it wasn't quite as cool <laughs> as I thought it would be. Has a little bit to do with the fact that it was freezing cold and, and, and no women and uh, other insanely hard physics classes. Actually, I had a lot to do with insanely hard physics classes. But mostly, it was, I had two experiences. One, my very first day of class, I used rational rows to draw a UML diagram, and then press the button with generated code, and then we filled in the code. And I was like, five <laughs> years of this? <laughs> <laughs> if that is what professional software development is like, I want no part of it. It just single-handedly killed my spirit for software. And the second thing was, I had this, I had this class where our, our professor gave us assignments, and we would push the assignments to a server, and it would compile our code, and then it would, uh, it would generate input, and then it would tell us what the output was, and then it would tell us you know, if we met it, which you know, people here might call tech. <laughs> and considering that I read extreme programming, explained when I was in, well, I guess it was ninth grade, so I was 15. I had been doing test-driven development for two or three years at that point. Not very well, mind you, but well enough that I knew the basic thing. Well enough that that when he said, we don't penalize for number of submissions, I said, <laughs> <laughs> yes. And <laughs> so I submitted this thing, and I come back the next day, and he's got this bar chart on the wall. And it's showing, there's just numbers, and you know, brought a bar chart. And on one end was the best students in the class. There were two people that only needed to submit their code once. And uh, they got it perfect the first time. And, but most people were like four or five submissions on this, and then there were like two outliers, really, really bad people that had eight submissions. And then there was me over here, and I had 24. <laughs> and he uses this chart in his lecture on mistakes in programming, mm -hmm. and how when you make mistakes, it leads to bugs, and bugs are the reason that software is late and over budget, and people don't want to use it. So let's ignore for a minute his less than stellar explanation of why software projects go late. But he, I, I thought he was just being an asshole, frankly. And I went to him after class and I tried to make my case. I was like, no, you know, I, I was just using that. I was getting feedback. I didn't want to stab around in the dark. I wanted to know what I should build next. So I'm just submitting and letting this tell me. And, and I tried to tell him that it only took me an hour when my friend three or four trying to get this assignment done. But he said, he said, well, your project manager isn't going to be so forgiving. Of making that <laughs> and he said that I won't have that kind of help on the final. So new policy, you get five free check-ins. After that, he takes off two or three percent of every check-in. So I quit college, and I played poker instead. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I and I eventually got back into software because I wrote like these poker training tools and then one of my friends was like, hey, you should make a website out of this. This will be really cool. <laughs> and so I did when Rails first came out and that's kind of how I got roped into this whole thing again. And I'm telling you this story because while the details are unique, my experience at this point is not particularly unique. That people come to software through different routes. And I want to focus on what I call the open source community. And some examples are the Ruby community and Python and Scala, but these are any community that has a really strong open source culture. 
So if your code, you know, if when you ask how do I do this, somebody says, oh, there's a plugin or a Jammer library on GitHub, that's a good sign. <laughs> the interesting thing about the open source community, and keep in mind, I'm, I'm talking about the people that are working within these communities in general, not, not necessarily open source projects, but the people that are involved in, in using these kinds of languages and go to those conferences and whatever. The interesting thing is that most of the agile practices are built in. And they're built in partly from open source, like the actual uh, attributes of open source, and partly just the people that are involved. So to start, transparency and openness built in. You're sharing your code with everybody. Everybody can see what's going on. We have discussions in the open on mailing lists. The few times that something gets done behind closed doors, it creates lots and lots of drama. And I'm talking flame wars that extend for days to weeks about why this person's an asshole and why that person's an idiot and, and whatever. But when as soon as you get rid of transparency and openness, drama occurs. And this is on something that people don't even get paid for. If your ass is on the line at work and you're not transparent and open, what do you think is going to happen? So this is something baked into the open source culture in general. Absolutely, you know, it doesn't apply to everybody, but in general, these principles are baked in. Trust is another big one. Who here needs trust on their project? Good answers, and a few people are asleep. Uh, <laughs> so, a really cool thing about open source in general is having, trusting people to do what they want or what they need with the tools available to them. And it's Anytime you say, I need to do this, and somebody working on something says, no, you don't, it's, that's another source of drama, another source of frustration, and there's no value created there. Open source communities trust you, that, trust you enough to say, go do whatever you want. And if there are enough people that can benefit from that, then they'll start to adopt that as well. And that takes us to collaboration. Collaboration built right into open source. We're sharing our code. This is people connecting, people communicating, people working on projects together. And ultimately, to come back to the Agile thing, value. All of our projects that we use are valuable to us in some way. And if it's not valuable, you don't just, you just don't use it. So some of the practices that Agile proponents talk about are, are kind of baked into the culture. And it doesn't come just inherently from open source, but it's just the people that are involved in this do this stuff. And test-driven development is a really big one. You know, for the last 10 years, it's been like test, 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 test first, test drive, test, you know, do test-driven design, do acceptance test-driven development. And if you look at the Ruby community, for example, I'm a big Ruby guy. Here's a, uh, here's a chart that Camp and Catlin, like we took a survey and he basically said, what are your thoughts on automated testing? And 51% say it's required. And 49% say it's not. So what, what percentage of like the Java community <laughs> in general says, would you say that 51% of the Java community says automated unit testing is required? I, mean, I don't know. And I've, I've seen, so, and the interesting thing is this is actually from Hampton who says that automated testing sucks. It's not useful. You're going to have to test it anyway. So the people that read his blog, you could say, are skewed towards the not required part. But the fascinating thing is there's a third part of it, which is do it often. And that's that's uh, 38%. So I think I got my numbers slightly wrong here. Uh, no, 51% said not required. Uh, so now 49% say automated unit testing is required. 38% say do it often. You've got 13% of this community says we don't need to test. 87% think that it's either required or beneficial in some way. And when you go to the Ruby conferences, like two or three years ago, there was the question, raise your hand if you test, and people would put their hands up. And uh, I remember when David Shalemsky presented RSpec, he said, so who uses RSpec? And about half the crowd put their hands in the air. And he said, who uses test units? And the other half of the crowd put their hands in the air. People, like the idea of, hey, you need to test, it's not an argument that you have. Nobody ever says, hey, you should test, because guess what? You guys have been, you guys have been making that case for 10 years. Actually, Alex, I was 
when I first met Alistair, he was like, I just don't get this high school game development stuff. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> like, I thought that, you know, that was the fundamental key of testing people. He's like, yeah, yeah, I, like, I write, I write some tests, the acceptance tests, but, you know, testing the little things, like, yeah, it's not very, not very useful. I arrive at a better design. Than, so, so not everybody, but, you know, a little, a little crazy, but no surprise there. <laughs> so the point is, in these communities, like, we just test by default. And other things, things are more for big, by the way, she gets four points for big. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> short iterations, that's something that, uh, part of it is we have such low overhead in our development environments that the, like, you just build a lot of stuff in a week. Like, if you, a week is a long, there is too much, if you were to write Ruby and Rails for a month and then demo it to your customer, you would overwhelm them. It would take two days just to show them everything that you're gonna build them. Like, that is just crazy. And another cool thing is that the teams are really small. Typically, you'll have anywhere from five to 10 person teams. Like, it doesn't get much bigger than that. Like, there's no such thing as a 50 person Ruby team. Like, it just does not happen. And it's because, be, because we've got the tools that allow us to move really rapidly and just get a lot of stuff done with a, with a small number of people. A, a core, core principle of Apple software development. And along with these short iterations go frequent releases. Most, most teams are releasing once a week or once every two weeks. Uh, a lot of people release multiple times a day. There are, even if you go to the, the conferences these days, anybody doing continuous, continuous deployment, so every time I check in, it runs the bill. Oh yeah, continuous integration, by the way, duh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> check, check in, run the test in your CI server, and as soon as it's green, ship it out to production. Production! It doesn't even go to staging to get demoed. It's just like, you know what? This is good enough. It, we'll show it to our customer. And I, I met five people at, at, Ruby, or at RailsConf last week that are doing continuous deployment. So, you know, it's not an overwhelming number at all, but I'm almost to the two hands, which is a significant milestone. Uh, excellence and craftsmanship, that's, it's an integral part of this community. If you talk with, talk with people, they really talk about being what craftsmanship. And I went to the Software Craftsmanship Conference in Chicago last year, and uh, Uncle Bob was giving a keynote. And he, he basically said he wanted to get a breakdown of the different languages that people were using to put food on the table. So he said, how many people are Ruby programmers? And like 60% of the conference put their hands up. And then he said, how many people are Python programmers? And that was like 30%. And so he just had a smattering of like Java and C Sharp. And like at that point, everything was equal, right? If you weren't Ruby and you weren't Java, you were, you were or if you weren't Ruby or Python, you were that other thing. And so this idea that, <laughs> this idea that we, <laughs> the, the untouchables. Uh, this is a very, very strong part of these open source community cultures. And so when you pull this all together, you get de facto agile. People aren't learning this stuff from the agile community. They're not even reading the agile books. It starts from the top, right? This is the third edition of the book, but the agile web development with Rails, first edition, if you look, first word, agile, right? In chapter 12 of this book is where they introduce testing and test-driven development. And the first book is, like 400 to 450 pages, and they spend 40 pages on testing and test-driven development. So if I'm like, hey, this Rails thing is really cool, it's gonna get me a job, or I'm gonna do my startup and make lots of money, how do I do it? The very first book I read, chapter 12, I'm learning about testing. There's, they spend 10% of the book, 10% of the pages in this book on testing, on testing, explicitly on testing, in the introductory manual to this entire culture. So it's coming from the top down, and that's why when you go to a conference, you don't say, do you test? But you, say, you say, how do you test? What tools do you test? What kind of testing do you do? All this stuff that we've been pushing for 10 years, it's not necessary for this other part of the software community. And so my question is, why is there so little collaboration between the Agile community and what I call, the, they're the new Agile community, the Generation X peers? The people that are doing, <laughs> the people that are doing XP without even calling it XP, right? 
we were here a few months ago, not in West Virginia Conference, but Alistair comes on stage to show his hexagonal arc. <laughs> <laughs> and like five, like if you lived in Salt Lake City, you knew who Alistair was. And if you were kind of a crazy person that once tracked him down an hour and a half away in Long Beach just so you could find your book, you also knew who he was. But the vast majority of people are just like, who is this crazy dude and why is he drawing shit on the board? <laughs> And given, given the, the contribution that the Agile community has made to software, I think it is a bloody shame that Rubius, I, I can't say for the other communities, but Rubius don't have a clue what's going on here. And so if you ask the open source communities what they think about, so they got so yeah, there's this whole Agile thing, there's this movement and stuff, you tell them about it, and they can say, ah, that's kind of boring. <laughs> Like, we've been doing this stuff already. What can we possibly learn from them? <laughs> and they're also a little bit slimy. You know, the, the, there was this thing a little while ago, this consultancy that said, you take our class, it's be guaranteed you 50% faster time to market and 25% more productivity. And actually, after <laughs> I put this slide on, uh, I found out that it's Rally. <laughs> one, of the, one of the sponsors here. So I don't know what protocol is on, on ripping a sponsor at the conference you're speaking at. Agile, uh, Agile Roots 2010, awesome. I won't see you at 2011. <laughs> <laughs> like, with, with all due respect to whatever work they do, anytime somebody in software comes to you and says 50% faster time to market and 25% more, more productivity, your inner skeptic should like be ratting around in your chest, you know? You should claw its way out and look for somebody to beat down. Like, what the hell is going on? And it tri it's triggering the, the, uh, the folks that I know that would have exactly this reaction. It's triggering, triggering their mental antibodies. Like, like, nobody can do this. It's like, well, that's because they've not been looking at what's been happening in Agile and open source. It's, it's not that you can't do it, they have to spend money to do it. Yeah, it's that, yeah, it's that, it, it's, 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 the, it's just the idea that you write me a fat check and I will give you all these things and, and I will produce and that's the these only real benefits that, the, that, that people, are, people are making it happen and it's very, very difficult stuff to do and the fact that you can guarantee it like that, because it literally says guarantee, mm -hmm. it's not going to happen. And so, Agile really hasn't been paying attention <laughs> to what's going on. You don't see this other community that's going on. They don't really see... <laughs> The, the, stuff that, the stuff that's going on within the community necessarily. And you're not recognizing that there are these other communities that are doing all this stuff that is supposedly core and fundamental and most important to Agile, and they're just doing it. And to me, I, I, look, at, I look at that and I say from, from a consultant's perspective or anybody in Agile, and say, well, why wouldn't I want to work with those people? Like, yes. Doing agile transformations, that's important, it's valuable, it's cool, but would you rather work on a team, would you rather go into an organization where the manager says you can't do test-driven development, or, uh, or would you rather work at a place where you say, hey guys, we're going to test drive, and they're like, yeah, okay, so then what? <laughs> so I was kind of having this talk with Jeff Patton, I had a chance to work with him at Agile Street, uh, Elizabeth Hendrickson set up this thing, they're doing amazing, amazing things. The idea was that you would get smart people in the room together and build software and just see what stuff you could do with minimal organizational friction. And we had Alan Cooper, interaction designer due to inmates from running the asylum. He played the customer. Brilliant guy, kind of crazy. Seems like that's, you know, when you get big in software, you are either start brilliant and go crazy or the craziness turns into brilliant except for your stuff gets validated. <laughs> <laughs> In the, the first day, he told us what we're going to build for the week. And the very first day, at the end of the day, he's like, okay, so I've got mixed feelings. He's like, this was really cool. I'm glad we did all this stuff, but I don't know what the hell to do for the rest of the week because I had this big plan, but you guys are pretty much done with it today. <laughs> and it's, it, this is, he, uh, he works for, I mean, he built his consultancy, Cooper, Huge, huge waterfall guy. He builds like he. They showed me the. He's like, hey Pat, you gotta look at this. This is a. This is what we give to the programmers, and it's like this. And they do months and months of research and build these beautiful documents, charts, and personas, and everything. And it's just absolutely gorgeous. And he literally could have killed me with it if he just, you know, hit me with it a couple times. <laughs> and he, he's holding this thing up and he says, 
he's like, you know, we're just, Cooper, we're brilliant. Our designers are brilliant. And then I hand this off to programmers, and we know that we're going to lose 40% of the benefits right off the bat, probably closer to 60%. And you know, it's kind of tough when somebody's really passionate and, and talking to you. You're like, duh. <laughs> <laughs> How the hell do you expect to build anything off of that? But now, in, in one day and in one week, he saw that he can work with agile software people and everything he thought about software, everything he thought about how software was supposed to be built started to get chipped away after one day and after one week, gone. And he's actually working with, with Ian and Pivotal Labs now. They're gonna be working on some projects. It's exciting, fascinating stuff. This is, there's been this talk, it's been a common theme this talk about getting interaction designers in with programmers. And so we're kind of at that weight of this. So Jeff, I'm, I'm telling Jeff about this and he says, like, I said, why don't you want to work with Ruby people? He was like, well, Ruby people don't care about creating value. Well, I got news, and this is the first <laughs> and oh, the last that's time word. you'll ever that's hear this, word. and it's on camera for the whole world to see. <laughs> Jeff Patton is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I love being able to. <laughs> You know, he's got points, and I, I have a blog post about this. We're running out of time, so you should go check out my blog to, to see what I said about that. But I interviewed people at Ruby Conference at the Rails Conf, and I asked them, you know, what, like, okay, what do you think of that? And everybody, like, people don't even know who he is, and they want to hit him. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I say, so, so what do you, and they're like, they're like, we get Can to we ship software. <laughs> For the first time, for the first time, we are able to build software and get it to our users very quickly. And we're, we're able to create value in a way that we've never really been able to before. And I talk to them, I say, so what's most important? And they say, they say, we have to work with the customer. We have to work with users. So Jeff, I know of at least five people in the Ruby community that do care about creating value. <laughs> and I would be so happy to get us all around a, a table together and, and do dinner and, and kind of talk about this stuff. If you sell it out. So. Jeff's next year's keynote will be uh, the rebuttal. <laughs> good, good. I'm on the, I want to see what happens in the next year. <laughs> <laughs> you guys will be there, right? Tom Street will be there. I'll, I'll, write, I'll write my angry blog post. Yeah, but you're still wrong. And he'll have a 2012 keynote. <laughs> we, both communities seem to be missing the forest for the trees here. The Agile community is still focused on the same stuff, not realizing that all this change that they're working on is going on in the world around them, whether they want to involve themselves in it or not. And the open source communities, and I, like the Ruby community, is kind of looking over our shoulders saying, okay, test of the development, story planning, iterations, all that stuff. Yeah, cool, what can we possibly learn from you guys? And you have to wonder at, at how smart that really is to say, here is a group of people that revolutionized how software was made, and yet we can't learn anything from them. So this is not, you know, Agile, Agile is, is missing this point here. It's not, like, it's not even about assigning blame. It's just about waking up and opening your eyes a little bit and saying, you know, this is about real collaboration, and it's collaboration at the team level, and it's collaboration at the community level. So what I want to do is I want to start bridging the gap, because I've talked about we already agree on the fundamentals of how to build software. And when you really look at it, what's been going on in the last 10 years of Agile is perfecting the fundamentals. All this stuff, all how to build software and setting up communication structures, that's the easy part. I mean, it's hard. <laughs> it's, it's, it's still hard, but that's the fundamentals. You have to walk before you can run. And so like the stuff, Jeff, the stuff that Jeff has been talking about, this isn't new. Jeff has been talking about it for 10 years. And it's just finally starting to gain traction. And I think a big part of it is that 
is, is that we're, we're, you have to arrive before you can run. We're, we're, we're to focus on the basic mechanics of software development. So when Jeff asked, how do you build a product? This, it was an idea ahead of its time that we are now finally ready to start answering that question, or to start thinking about that question. And it, it's vitally important, and that is, as you see, that is the common theme for this conference. I thought, hey, I'm gonna talk about this awesome new idea, we'll put interaction designers in the room of programmers, and <laughs> right, like everybody's talking about it. And <laughs> saying like the, the Ruby community's build it better than anybody, so if you wanna build a cool product, work with us. And, and so how do, you, how do you bridge this? Well, I think the lean startup ideas provide some common ground. There's all, all this stuff about designing products and iterating rapidly and testing things, the main startup is starting to talk about that. And the cool thing about these open source communities that go really, really fast, they are able to create higher fidelity tests in the same amount of time that, that and basically that people can write out sketches. I can sit down and write out the Nocker app in an hour that lets somebody pull some stuff from Yelp and, and put it into our system in a really basic way and see if that's gonna work. So now we're at this paradigm shift. We talked about requirements coming from customers, but now, as we've talked about this weekend, requirements come from users and customers. The customers, half the time, don't even know what's gonna work. That's the cool thing about this stuff. We are building software in, in, in an environment of incredible uncertainty, where we have this idea, this new innovation, and we don't even know if it's gonna work. And so that was kind of Jeff's point, is that when you build something that you don't know is gonna work, or you don't think it's going to work, where you have all the evidence in the world that says it won't work, and then you build it anyway, mm -hmm. you're, 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 you're back, in, you're in the last 10 years, you're not thinking forward. That's that cringy part. <laughs> <laughs> and so we go from asking our customer, is this what you want, or is this what you meant, and now we're starting to ask, is it what you want? So, and we test this stuff using, you know, we put an idea out there, and it kind of looks, you know, we, we talk about is there computer science in software? And historically, the you know, people that write books say no, you know, for practical purposes, there's no computer science. But I think what we're seeing now is that there absolutely is software science. That we create an idea and we test it. We have a hypothesis and we test it and we see how our results match up. So we're absolutely doing some kind of science. So I'm, I'm sort of running out of time here. But here, Agile is obsolete. That's that's why I'm here to tell you, right? And you guys follow. Oh, Joke's on you! <laughs> the, point, the point is not that, that Agile is somehow obsolete, but to recognize what is Agile's area of expertise? This, I stole that right. <laughs> change. You know how many organizational change talks there are at RubyConf? There are none. It's about taking groups of, it's taking diverse skill set people and synthesizing new ideas and ultimately delivering value. And we can work with the open source community who are innovative and they're fast and intensely pragmatic. And we can work with the interaction designers who have good ideas for products and who care about the users. This, this is probably where the compassion in software development comes. Right, the interaction designers thinking about how will this work for the user, and God knows we could all use more compassion in software. Amen. Yeah. So I want to join forces here. There's market opportunities, I think, for uh, like as, as Pivotal is doing with Super, they are going to to work work together. And for people that are just building software and we construct it the right way, that's been good. It's no longer good enough. You have to build things that people care about. By working with the open source communities, you've also got a new platform for your ideas. That's why I want uh, Alistair to come speak at RubyConf. He's got some interesting stuff, and there are people that are interested in this. And I find that if, if you talk with them, they'll find it interest. You'll find them interesting as well. This, by the way, is a picture of platform surfing, which is like these people like get on this really big platform and uh, well, surf. There's no surf out there, so it's okay. <laughs> Stream <laughs> programming, right? You just need a laptop. <laughs> <laughs> so, Surgeon's Law, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, Surgeon's Law says 90% of everything is crap. <laughs> Probably, a, I, well, it's a law, so a 
absolutely <laughs> apply. But 90% <laughs> of that law is crap, right? So, <laughs> but what I want is I want to get the top 10% talking. I want the top 10% of Ruby programmers talking with top 10% of Agile people talking with top 10% of, of interaction designers. Let's have a conference. Let's have a conference. There you go. So it's going to be called 10% conference. <laughs> so we're going to beat third new conference. Right, well, we'll figure it out. Well, it's, 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 so you guys are, are invited. This is my, my formal invitation. I want to hear from you guys. We've got delegates from the Ruby community, if you will, here. I want you guys to participate. Uh, well, I'm going to name him. Mike Moore behind the camera. He's somebody to talk to. Andrew Clay Schaefer, the dude that runs this whole thing. Uh, well, one of, one of the people behind this amazing conference, by the way. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> and here's a really simple way to get started. RubyConf 2010, right around the corner in New Orleans. It's going to be fun. I'll be there. So it's a friendly invitation, but I'm also throwing down the gauntlet here. I'm challenging you. I'm challenging you to look at Look at what you're doing and look back at the last few years and recognize that everything that we've done so far is immensely valuable. But now we're on the next phase of software. Stop. Don't be satisfied with showing people how to test drive, with doing short iterations, with, well, the story planning stuff still means a lot of work. So. <laughs> <laughs> but don't be satisfied with that. Recognize that we are in merely one phase of a very, very exciting industry. And after we get this whole how do we build a product that people care about stuff out of the way, there's going to be something new. I yeah. don't know what it is, and I don't know if it's going to take us 2, 5, 10, 25 years to get to it, but we, uh, but we will. And so my invitation and my challenge to you guys to take the next step, and that's what I got.